Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, May 20th, 2020. On this episode, we're talking about property rights, something that I don't really cover much at all, but really should probably more and more because so many of the founders considered it a foundation for all other liberty. And it's sometimes even suggested that the founders themselves didn't really even care about property rights or they didn't consider it very important because it, the term property was only included in the Constitution just one time. But this view couldn't be more wrong. So I'm going to go over some of the basics. I'm going to go over some of the highlights of where the Constitution actually was intended to be a defense for property rights, even if it isn't overtly stated like that. And then I've got a bunch of quotes from leading founders going back through the revolutionary times going forward. And I think you're going to enjoy this as much as I will. But thank you so much for being here. First of all, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. We've got a bunch of live streaming platforms. We're on YouTube, Facebook, DLive, Twitch, Periscope, and I forgot one, Twitter. Yeah, I think I may have already said that. But our archive versions are on Brighteon, BitChute, BitTube, and Library. We also have audio-only podcast editions, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and elsewhere. Find all the platforms we're on, all the archives to the show. And in each show that's listed on the website, I have an overview. You can find all the different platforms for each specific episode with links to those and then links to stuff that I reference for example, I'm going to put links to various papers and speeches and things like that that I'm covering and a couple of articles as well. That's all over at 10 amendmentcentercom slash path to liberty. And mind you, you can also subscribe to our email newsletter or support us financially for as little as two bucks a month. And we make it go a long, long way. Again, it's 10 amendmentcentercom slash path path to liberty. And before getting to it, I just want to say a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat, whether you join me live or in the archive video or audio, it doesn't matter. I am just so grateful that you're willing to listen, you're interested enough to listen. And for those of you leaving feedback, whether you tell me I suck or it's awesome or whatever, I am very, very grateful for all of that. So thank you so much. I want to say hi to Shane Lackey, Tyler B. Ward Lawrence, Essential Freedom, Patricia Dance, Heather Rossi, Justin Bayola. Uh, SAH Biochemist, Dan Warsaw. Good to see you, Dan. It's been a while, I think. Uh, Justin Morrison, MRGF78, Larry Clark, Austin Thomas, Too Tall 509, and The Chicken Man. You guys are all great. I'm very grateful. You're great, and I'm so grateful for you being here. I'm sorry if I missed anybody. I'm just kind of scrolling through this Restream chat app and trying to say hi to as many as people as possible, and thank you for being here. So let's get right to it. Before I continue rambling, let's start out about the right to property. The introduction to this uh, this post from Annenberg Classroom is pretty good. It goes a little bit off the rails when it kind of focuses on, and this is what a lot of mainstream places will do, is they're just going to say, well, now the Supreme Court says, even when they get it right for the founding generation, they're like, well, the Supreme Court changed that in this year. But the Constitution, this is taking the view that, this is taking the view that the Constitution means what the Supreme Court says it means until it changes its mind. But this is a total lie. This is a side kind of discussion that I should have in a future episode. But the short version is, is that the Constitution is a legal document. And like any legal document, the meaning of the words in that legal document are what they meant or were understood to mean at the moment it was given legal force by the parties that gave it legal force. And for, for the Constitution itself, this is an 18th century legal document that used de definitions from dictionaries in the 18th century, and the people who gave it legal force were the people of the several states through their ratifying conventions. So that's a quick side note, but let's talk about the right to property. And this introduction over at Annenberg Classroom is pretty great. They say, few rights have been more prominent throughout American history than, prominent, than property rights. Ownership of property, they said, was not an end in and of itself. It was a right that protected liberty. Now, I would say that they're basically the same thing. You can't have liberty without property. And there's a, a founder that has basically the same position a little bit later on. But they say it was a right that protected liberty, which is why it appears in the Fifth Amendment as a restraint on governmental power. It's no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. 
Now, it's not just the Fifth Amendment, even though it's so expressly stated there in the Fifth, talking about property in the Bill of Rights. There's all other parts in the Constitution that actually are dealing with property rights. For example, and here's from an article from Rob Nadelson that we published about a decade ago, back in 2011. He writes, the founders were worried that Congress might use the tax system to loot property owners in some states for the advantages of other states, kind of what we live under today. So they required that direct taxes, most importantly, property and income taxes, be apportioned among the states. This is Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, and Article 1, Section 9, Clause 4 of the Constitution, pretty much dealing with property rights. They also required, Rob writes, that indirect taxes, such as import duties, be levied uniformly. This is Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, Article 1, Section 9, or Section 9, Clause 6, and they flatly denied the power, Congress, the power to tax exports. And that is also Article 1, Section 9, Clause 5. I'm not going to go through every single one. I will link to this article in the show notes at 10th Amendment Center.com slash path to liberty. But there's a few others that I want to highlight here. They the founders granted Congress authority to punish piracy, a crime directed principally against property. So if you're like pir piracy, old school piracy on the high seas, they're stealing. Uh, they're stealing someone's property. And that's really a property rights issue. They also added the full faith and credit clause. And if you look through the historical records, it's primarily not what a lot of people think it is today, but partly it was to require state courts to honor property records in other states. This is what they talked about during the ratification conventions, and this is what they talked about in Philadelphia, that this was one of the reasons that this clause even exists, to require courts in each state to honor property records. The next was the Constitution's Privileges and Immunity Clause. Article 4, Section 2, Clause 1, it protected the rights of citizens doing business and owning land in other states, including Rob rights, by the way, the rights of women and free African-American citizens. The founders also, he writes, gave Congress an unlimited power to dispose of public land. Dispose of. Not own, not occupy, which is totally, they've got it backwards these days. What a surprise. Just like when you're not supposed to have an accumulation of debt, they do it exactly opposite. So they gave Congress an unlimited power to dispose of public land. That's in Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2, but only limited power to acquire or hold land. This was because they wanted most publicly owned land to be transferred to the private sector. And again, another piece, and I'm skipping over some of them. But then we get to the Bill of Rights. And Rob also points out not just the Fifth Amendment, but he talks about the Third, which prevented the government from quartering troops in private homes. This is respecting property rights because the the British Empire, they quartered troops. New York was kind of a place where that was a hot spot early on around the Townsend Act, 1767, 1768, for example. And we'll be covering some quotes from that time, primarily John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution in a few minutes. But the Third Amendment is a property rights issue. If you own your home, you're, a man's house is his castle. That's the old saying against the writs of assistance. A man's house is his castle. And if the government can just come in and plop people in there, and one might make the argument about property taxes, too. I'm not really getting into that today. But if they can come in there and use it for their own purposes, you don't really own the property. Government does. And this is a huge protection of property rights in the Third Amendment. And then also the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment, we talk, we think it's just about surveillance. But really, the, right at, the rights that we're concerned about is property rights. Ownership of oneself, one's persons, one's houses, one's papers, and one's effects. And government can't just go rifling through it because you own it without permission or without probable cause. So these are really, really interesting pieces. So when people tell you that the founders didn't really care about property rights or that Thomas Jefferson was some kind of proto-socialist and he wanted public ownership of everything, this is nonsense because they were really all on board with restricting at least the central government from having this type of power over the, your own property. And Rob sums it up like this. He says, this is quite an extensive list. The only reason it wasn't even longer was because the Constitution was designed to give the federal government only limited power over property, limited power in general. The federal government, as 
reaffirmed in the Tenth Amendment was based on a principle of positive grant. That is, the federal government can only exercise those powers delegated to it and nothing more. Period. End of story. Everything else is reserved to the people and the states, the people of the several states, as they see fit in each state. Rob goes on. He says, under their constitution, the states, not the federal government, would be the primary protectors and regulators of property. So they didn't. Either, they didn't also didn't want the federal government to be a liberty enforcement squad. My buddy Mike Meharry always calls people calls the federal government this when people are basically begging the largest government, the largest empire in the history of the world to come protect them against local despots, local tyrants. No, no, the founders recognized that this was a real problem because, again, whatever power you give to someone today to do the things that you like will eventually be used by someone in the future for totally opposite reasons. Going forward, I think that was a pretty good overview of some of the parts of the Constitution that actually protect property rights. But really, to understand this further, we should go back in history a little bit further to understand that this wasn't just out of nowhere. This was an ongoing issue, an ongoing concern, and the founders recognized property rights as being a foundation for all others. I've got an interesting one from James Madison in a little bit. Here, for example, is James Otis. 1765, this was a uh, paper called A Vindication of the British Colonies Against the Aspersions of the Halifa Halifax Gentleman in his letter to a Rhode Island friend. <laughs> That's an amazing title. He says, the absolute liberties of Englishmen, mind you, this is they were still considered loyal subjects. They all considered themselves loyal subjects at the time of the king, but they still felt that they had these rights. So the absolute liberties of Englishmen, as frequently declared in Parliament, are principally three. One, the right of personal security, personal security, not government security, two, personal liberty, and three, private property, private property. It's so important. He actually said the natural, absolute personal rights of, of individuals are so far from being opposed to political or civil rights that they are the very basis of all municipal laws of any great value. So those three things are the basis for really everything else. Personal security, personal liberty, and private property, all the way back to 1765. But this was based on hundreds of years of tradi tradition that was just being reiterated by the colonists and led by people like James Otis. I mentioned John Dickinson, and I've covered him so many times on this show. He was very influential. They called him the penman of the revolution. And here again, as I've cited so many times, in letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania against the Townsend Acts, heavily focusing on the New York Restraining Act. This was dealing with quartering of troops, for example. This was partially that. And in the 12th letter, this is 1767, 1768, really 1768 by the time this one is published. I don't have an exact date. He says, let these truths be indelibly impressed on our minds that we cannot be happy without being free. And I think this he makes a really cool connection from one to the next to the next. This is a progression of how you have happiness and liberty. We cannot be happy without being free. We cannot be free without being secure in our property. We cannot be secure in our property if, without our consent, others may, as by right, take it away. And this could be whether it's quartering troops, searching your person's house's papers and effects. It could be taxation. Basically, if they can go through your property, treat your property as if it's theirs, and do things with it or take it without your permission. It is not your property. But John Dickinson also, like James Otis, recognized that you cannot be free without security in your property rights. Going further, that was John Dickinson in 1767. Here's Samuel Adams. You're going to hear basically the same thing. And the reason that I'm going through some of these quotes and year by year is because I want you to recognize that I know a lot of people say you can't really say the founder said blank because there is deviance or deviance. There's variance in some of their opinions. These are individuals. But on things like this and war powers, for example, they were all very consistent. It wasn't just consistent after the Revolutionary War started, the war to secede from Great Britain. 
It was consistent over a period of decades. The same type of message was coming from founder after founder, from revolutionary after revolutionary. And here's Samuel Adams in 1772. This was in the rights of colonists. Again, what liberty can there be where property is taken away without consent? That's 1772. So we have 1765, 68, 72 from various people with the same same message. Now, Dickinson was considered a moderate. Of course, Otis and Adams were the radicals, the rabble rousers, but it's the exact same message, and that was in 1772. Now, John Jay was not considered a rabble rouser. He ended up being the first chief justice of the Supreme Court. Can you imagine a chief justice of the Supreme Court saying this? And this was in 1774 in address to the people of Great Britain. No power on earth. No power on earth has a right to take our property from us without our consent. Again, same message. This guy would have been at the time of ratification and probably all the way through. He's more of a big government guy in comparison. Now, if we're grading on a curve, even the big government people of the time in general were the smallest government people of today. Again, we're talking about living under the largest government in the history of the world. And they were living under the largest government in the history of the world at that time as well. And they were the radicals. But John Jay, amongst the radicals, was more in the Washington, Hamilton, James Wilson camp as time went on. John Adams, for example, as well. But still, and even as the first chief justice, this was his principled stand, that no one on earth, there is no power that has a right. Even though it happens, there's a difference between what they do by force and violence versus what they have a right to do and what the people should have eventually a line in the sand about. No power on earth has a right to take our property from us without our consent. Again, that was John Jay in 1774. This is a one that I had only learned about when I was researching what I wanted to include as far as quotes. I had never seen this one. This is from Arthur Lee in Virginia in 1775, an appeal to the justice and interests of the people of Great Britain. He says, the right of property is the guardian of every other right, and to deprive a people of this is in fact to deprive them of their liberty. Again, this is the notion that property rights, ownership of oneself, ownership of one's labor, the product of one's labor, and ownership of one's home. Whether you sign a lease, if you have a, a, a lease with someone, you own the space or you're renting the space and you act as, as the owner of that for the time that you have it. So again, the right of property is the guardian of every other right. That's basically the same thing that John Adams said if we fast forward a little bit in 1790-ish. It was a Discourses on Davila. Davila? I'm not sure how to say it. I only learned it from reading. And he said property must be secured or liberty cannot exist. You can't have liberty without private property. This is, again, a consistent view from the founders. John Adams, even one of the big government guys of the time. This was when he was vice president. And James Madison's paper in 1792 I thought was just incredible. I haven't read it in quite a while, but it's basically, it's just titled Property, March 29th, 1792. And he writes about property. I'm not sure what newspaper it was actually published in. But basically, he's explaining the relationship between property rights and other natural rights, saying they're really the same thing. He says, in a word, as a man is said to have a right to his property, he may equally said to have a property in his rights. And he gives some various examples. So a uh, right to one's property, for example, could be a person's land or merchandise or money. That's someone's property. But then also, someone has a property in their opinions and their free communication of them. You have a property of peculiar value, James Madison, in your religious opinions and the profession and practice dictated by them. For example, you also have property very dear to you in your li safety and liberty of your person. And every person has equal property in the free use of their faculties and free choice of the objects on which to employ them. So Madison is taking this long tradition and pointing out the tie, the close tie-in, and maybe the exact same thing, of property rights and other natural rights. Because without owning yourself, how can you have liberty in thought and action? So you have self-ownership. This is personal, individual sovereignty. And it is such an important point to be made 
we have to focus on that. If we want to look at striking the root and understanding root causes of problems, when people are treated not as self-owners, then of course government is going to be given power to do all kinds of stuff to violate other. I mean, I don't understand how people on the left are so surprised that government goes in and searches people and they oppose all kinds of mass warrantless surveillance. They're not fans of it. They don't like asset forfeiture or police civil asset forfeiture where they take property. But then on the other hand, they treat everyone as like when you act like a socialist or you are one and then you don't respect private property, you shouldn't be surprised when government treats everybody like that in other areas that maybe you don't want them to. Well, while maybe they want to, quote, tax the rich and get everyone to, quote, pay their fair share or whatever the phrase that they're using, then you've established the principle that government is the owner of people's labor, the product of people's labor. And it doesn't take too much of a leap to say that government has the right to do all kinds of other stuff, asset forfeiture, surveillance, and the like. And the same could be said for gun control. So if you say that they can take your gun, why couldn't they take your car? It's just up to government to make the decision. That's why we have to focus on self-ownership and property rights as the foundation. And this one I thought was a really good one to sum it up with. This is James Otis again, going back to 1764 on the origin of government. He says, and this is kind of a tip of the hat to my ANCAP friends out there who will watch and listen from time to time. He says, if life and liberty could be enjoyed in as great perfection, I'll try that again. If life and liberty could be enjoyed in as great perfection in solitude as in society, there would be no need of government. Well, looking over at the live chat and taking a quick look, uh, the Salt Lakers has a great quote from John Adams. Uh, he talks about liberty once lost is lost forever. That was a letter to his wife, Abigail. I forget the year. Salt Lakers also says, I keep calling the NSA to see if they can help me find my car keys. <laughs> right? Man. They know. They know where it is. Ward Lawrence says, property taxes are a ploy to steal your property. In essence, you could make the case that they're, they own it and then you're just renting it from government. I know other people are going to make different arguments. James Rawlinson says, life without liberty. This is awesome. On Facebook, James says, life without liberty is indistinguishable from music without sound. Ed Ligo says, property, does that include land? Yes. Yes, uh, the founder specifically mentioned your home, your land, uh, your farm, for example. If you own it and you you utilize it, uh, then it's certainly yours. Robert Scott Bell, my great buddy who does the Robert Scott Bell Show six days a week. I watch almost every day on YouTube from noon to 2 p.m. Pacific time. It's health freedom and political freedom. RSB says real estate and private property are not the same thing. If they can tax it, it's not yours. And that's basically going back to what I was suggesting. And I forget who else. Oh, Ward Lawrence was saying down in Texas, basically they're they're charging you rent. So it should be the other way around. If government wants to come on the property, you charge them rent. But that's not how it is in practice. Kyle Reese is asking for specifics. I'm sorry if I'm not being detailed enough. Scott Lashua. Uh, some in oh, okay. I think I'm just out of context. Bob Brewer, also down in Tyler, Texas, reciting Arthur Lee in 1775. It's such a great quote, and I just had never read it. I got it from that Annenberg article, Annenberg Classroom. The right of property is the guardian of every other right. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope you found it educational. I learned something. Every time I do research, I have a base of what I want to talk with you guys about, uh, what I want to share with you, and then I start digging in. And almost every time I find something new, and I'm uh, maybe I'm just geeking out, but I, to me it's pretty exciting. And I just want to reiterate how important the right of self-ownership, the right of private property is to every other right if we can even separate them. I really can't. And I think that's basically what James Madison was saying in 1792. They really are all about private property. And when government violates any rights, they're violating all of them, really. And I think that's basically how he sums it, sums it up. I'm going to include the link to that. I encourage you to read it. It's a kind of a short essay. And it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, again, if you support the show, there's a number of free things that you can do to help us get the word out. All the platforms you may watch or listen on are have pretty easily triggered algorithms. So just taking actions on the show 
tells the algorithm to show the program to more people. So you can smash the like button, you can leave comments, whether it's live or in the archive, subscribing, getting notifications, YouTube, you can click that bell iTunes, for example, you can leave a review. I am very grateful for, I haven't checked for a few days, but we've been con getting consistent, a consistent increase in reviews over on iTunes. And therefore our podcast numbers, our downloads keep going up consistently. And that really, really helps a lot. And then also, if you want to pitch in financially, I see a number of people out there who are already members. And I'm very grateful for that. We make it go a long way, and our membership program starts as little as 2 bucks a month. You can sign up for that over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, I'm so grateful for you spending some time with me today. I'm going to look through the rest of the comments a little bit later today. And even though I read all of them, I don't get a chance to reply to everything, but I do see everything that you guys leave for me, and thank you for doing that. I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.